there was an elderly lady living in a low-income housing project. In her comings and goings, she would greet her neighbors with an hallelujah shout-out. Praise God! Hallelujah, Jesus! Her next-door neighbor, an atheist, tried to cancel her by responding every time, condescendingly and dismissively, there is no God. Time passed, and this exchange became routine. An extremely cold and difficult winter came, not hard to imagine today. The lady was sharing with a different neighbor that her food had run out. Her cupboard was bare. Please pray for the Lord to provide, she was saying, as her atheist neighbor passed by. The next morning, the lady opened her door, found two bags of groceries at her door. She gave a shout out of joy, praise God, hallelujah, Jesus. The atheist next door was ready. He opened his door and called her down. There is no God. I bought those groceries for you. The lady didn't hesitate. Praise God, you provided food and you had the devil pay for it. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. The point of the story is that this woman saw and recognized God in Jesus Christ, even in stressful times and even in the face of challenge and unbelief. Unbelief being arguably the biggest sin of all. The popular 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said, Unbelief is the sin which keeps the power of the gospel from working in the sinner. That's a quote from his sermon entitled, Of All Things, The Sin of Unbelief. Unfortunately, not all stories of faith are so lighthearted as this one of the elderly lady. April 1942, U.S. forces lost the island of Bataan. Is that how you pronounce it? Bataan? In the Philippines to Japanese forces. A nurse there, her name Ruth Straub, wrote in her diary, I know there is not an atheist on Bataan. When the bombs come, everyone lies on the ground and prays aloud, regardless of who is around. And later in that war, the Associated Press quoted a, a lieutenant colonel as saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. I'm sure you've heard that phrase. The colonel didn't say if the foxhole experience and the hell of that experience would result in praise of God or rejection of God which sadly does happen. There are self-acclaimed atheists who express anger with a God they don't believe in. It's often in times of great stress that people look for God, look for the divine, and try to make sense of what's going on around them and also to appeal to that power for absolution and for a way out of the fine messes that people get themselves into. Good things happen in life against the backdrop of bad things that happen. That is where many people recognize the divine and the holy, being able to differentiate good from bad. If only good ever happened, this would not be earth. It would be heaven. We recognize that which is good because we have known bad Today is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, four Sundays out of six, and I have to wonder why so many weeks, why do we need six weeks talking of Epiphany? It might be because some people catch on quickly. For them, they just need one Sunday of Epiphany, one experience of Epiphany would be adequate for them. Others of us are not quick studies. And so six Sundays, we point to how different people came to and come to the light bulb moment to where they see and saw the light of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, where they recognize the work of God in the world. 
In each of the four Gospels, each Gospel writer tells the story differently. And they each point to different events in the life of Jesus in which people recognized the divine. In the Gospel of Matthew, the first public epiphany was when the three wise men from the east visited baby Jesus in the manger. The Gospel of John records the first public epiphany of Jesus as coming from John the Baptist and his witness. And in the Gospel of Luke, the first public epiphany was by the shepherds in the field who went and saw the baby Jesus. And then they spread the word around the countryside. In the Gospel of Mark, the first public recognition of Jesus comes at a synagogue. There was only one temple, only one innermost sanctum, one holy of holies, one dwelling place of God in Judaism. The destruction of the temple and the spreading of the Hebrews to be slaves across the empires that defeated them created a need for a place to worship, of worship. And so synagogues became the places of worship for the Hebrew people. They became the places of not only worship, but also of learning. They said that where 10 Hebrew families were located, there was a synagogue. This was where one would go as a Jew to learn and to come closer to God. The public recognition of Jesus as one with God for Mark begins with Jesus teaching in the synagogue. Now, it's not surprising to me that a place of learning would be ripe as a place for the epiphany of Jesus. Places of learning, in my experience, tend to be places of great stress and anxiety. Think back to when you were in school. Exams in particular were, were stressful. For me, probably because I was not known to pay much attention in class. Places of learning are even more stressful when confidence is low that what is being taught will be helpful for free and critical thinking. Jesus, Mark says, taught with authority, not like teachers of the law. Teaching with authority could mean a lot of things. Perhaps uh, one is that uh, teaching with authority would be that one speaks with charisma. Maybe Jesus was easy listening. Or perhaps he explained things so as to open their minds. I also wonder in this passage, how was it that the teachers of the law taught? Why was it different? They were the academics of the day, well studied in the books of law and in the oral tradition. Maybe they were so wrapped up in being right that they forgot to be truthful. Maybe their teaching indoctrinated rather than encouraged reason and rationality. I don't know. I just don't know. The scripture simply says that Jesus did not teach like the teachers of the law. Some scholars say that Jesus taught with personal authority, while the teachers of the law always had to make reference to some past legal interpretation, somebody else's ideas. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is quoted in repetitive cycles time and again where he begins a teaching by saying, you have heard it said, and he concludes the teaching by saying, but I tell you. The authority he appeals to is, his, is himself, not to some obscure rabbi somewhere in the past. I do know that teaching with authority is not the same as teaching, as speaking with confidence. Confidence does not necessarily make the speaker truthful in what they're saying. I once watched a local television news clip. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, watched a local television news clip where they were doing a public interest piece on a local pilot. He flew an aerobatic airplane in air shows. That was his love in life. <clears throat> and he was very happy for the recognition of this news station. So they began with an interview uh, down on the ground, talking about his airplane, walking around his airplane. 
He showed them how to pre-flight the airplane and what to look for while you're walking around before you go flying. Now, this particular airplane had a strut angled between the wing and the fuselage. And as he walked around the airplane, he discovered that one of the struts was loose. He very confidently and believably explained that the struts were not required for flight, that they were not load-bearing, and that the airplane was very strong even without the struts. So he took off the loose strut, and for symmetry, he took off the one on the other side as well. And then he went flying so that the TV crew could film some of his stunts. As much confidence as he had in this and in his teaching, he did not survive when a wing folded up on him during a loop. The point is that just because someone speaks loudly, persistently, or with confidence, that does not make what they have to say truth. Jesus speaks, and he speaks to us, often quietly and in our hearts, both with authority and with the power of truth. Whatever it was that set Jesus apart from the teachers of the law, the people who heard were amazed. They were amazed. But that amazement did not result in public recognition or public sharing of their recognition of Jesus as divine. The scripture goes on to, to, to relate, there was a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit. In the New Testament, we see time and time again where both demons and unclean spirits recognize and confess Jesus Christ as divine. Jesus has the authority and power that displaces unclean spirits and demons from where they should not be. A Reverend Bates once shared the observation. He said, there are no atheists in hell. Even the devils believe and tremble. In the Gospel of Mark, we're told that a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And he shared the epiphany, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That epiphany, that recognition was salvation for that man. The separation of the impure spirit from the man simply by a word not only amazed those in the synagogue, but so totally blew them away that they spread the news across the whole region. Praise God and hallelujah Jesus. Right? Recognition of the divine cannot be kept to self. I really don't know if it's important or not, but it stood out, me, stood out to me in my reading in Mark that this man is referred to as having an unclean or impure spirit. In the original Greek, it's pneumati akarthato. I can't even pronounce it. It's Greek, using two words, uh, pneumati for pneumatic and akarthato in the original Greek. Demons in the Bible are referred to in the original Greek with the word demonia. So it's a different word. I don't know if there's a difference between impure spirit and demon because of the two words, different words being used. Uh, I don't think that there's difference. If there is a difference, for me, it's not that much important. Impure spirit or demon, either way, refers to principalities and powers that take life away from living. Jesus, in his ministry, as he continued his ministry, he taught the spiritualities that lead to godliness and to life. We can see them in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He teaches that blessed are, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are not self-righteous, and the grieving, those who mourn for others, they are blessed. Also a meek spirit, one that pursues, hungers for righteousness, the merciful, the compassionate spirit, the pure in heart, and the peacemaker. People with any of these spiritualities will be blessed with life. 
Conversely, there are also spiritualities that do not lead to blessings in life. They detract from life and take away from it. They steal from wholeness and completeness in individuals. In the book entitled The Seven Evil Spirits, the author outlines seven different unclean spirits that were manifest in cultures, in the peoples, in tribes and nations in the ancient world that surrounded and influenced the Hebrew people. The Hittites li lived life controlled by fear. Fear causes phobias and depression, among other things. The Girgashites were atheists, not believing anything unseen. The Amorites were prideful and domineering. The Canaanites dominated by emotion, which led them to addictions and perversions. The Parasites suffered low self-esteem, laziness, and they lived without structure. The Hivites were hedonistic, making pleasure their, their god, and the Jebusites were legalistic and oppressive. Only one viewpoint was allowed, and it had to be theirs. We don't hear any of that today, do we? Every human being across the ages and today, everybody battles impure spirits of some sort. Our saving grace is the epiphany of God, made complete in Jesus Christ. Unclean spiritualities do not stand against the word of God. It does not stand against fear, depression, pride, or addiction, or only self-interest and self-gratification. So for all of us who live today, who are not living life as we should, where life feels dark or black or lifeless, each one of us, we could be that man in the synagogue. Recognize Jesus in your life, and whatever it is that's keeping you from living will be cast out. Even in the bleakest winter, no matter how hungry you are, no matter what stress is taking away from life, a good start is to lift your voice. Praise God and hallelujah Jesus. In Christ's presence, all is good. Amen.